I'm Luke Story. For the past 22 years, I've been relentlessly committed to my deepest passion, designing the ultimate lifestyle based on the most powerful principles of spirituality, health, psychology, and personal development. The Lifestylist Podcast is a show dedicated to sharing my discoveries and the experts behind them with you. Here we go again. Robert Slovak, deep dive. Deep dive. Oh man, I'm so glad we get to have this conversation. So let's just dive right in. For those that don't know, uh, Robert was on a previous episode also recorded here at lovely Cuixmala in Mexico, where we talked about uh, Quinton Sea Minerals, water filtration, uh, the best drinking water practices, all the things, the busting alkaline myths and all that. But today we're going to talk about deuterium depletion and uh, molecular hydrogen. Right. So break down in as simple terms as you can. What is deuterium? How did we get it in our body? Why do we want to get it out? Okay. If you don't mind me going back just briefly, 13.7 billion years, one of the first things that was created was hydrogen and helium. Okay. And um, it's quite important to realize that because currently 13.7 billion years later, it just turns out that about 99% of the mass of the entire universe is still hydrogen and helium together, okay? It's really, if to a scientist, it's preposterous, <laughs> okay? All the other elements, all the other 90 elements, they're just like 1% of the universe, you know? All the planets, it's just hardly anything. Hydrogen and helium run the show. And of course, they're the content of most stars when you look at it at night. So this is my trusty periodic table that I uh, take with me everywhere. because People are a little lost, but this is all the elements of the periodic table. And the first, because it's the lightest element, is hydrogen. But few people realize there's more than one hydrogen. And even fewer people realize there's more of most of the elements, different variations of each of the elements. And those variations we call isotopes. I think a lot of people have heard that it's used in medicine and so on. But hydrogen happens to have three isotopes. One is the regular hydrogen, we'll call it. That's just a proton and an, and an electron, the simplest element that was created. And then another isotope, uh, the second isotope, is heavier because it has taken on a neutron into its nucleus. So you have a proton, a neutron, and an electron. And that's called deuterium. And it was created at the very beginning also. The neutron really liked playing in the sandbox with the proton. And then there is another form of hydrogen that we won't talk about anymore, and that's tritium. And that's a slightly radioactive isotope. And it has two neutrons and a proton. And we call it, it's unstable, so it gives off rays and matter and has a half-life of about, I think it's about 13 years. And it has been used in the past 50 years as a, a glowing indicator for watch faces. Okay? If you paint it on with some phosphors, you get it to glow. So we'll concern ourselves with hydrogen and the regular hydrogen, which is called protium, by the way, and the heavier isotope, deuterium. Now, what really blew everybody's mind when they discovered deuterium in, in, in the early 30s was that deuterium is twice as heavy as its sister isotope or brother isotope, protium. And that is like, wow, it's the only element that has an isotope that's twice as heavy. And in the world of atoms, twice as heavy is like if your girlfriend were twice as heavy as you, okay? I mean, it, it makes a statement, right? Or if you woke up twice as heavy. Is the 
the uh, molecule twice as large atom. also? Atom. Is the atom twice as large also or just heavy? No. Oh, well, that's weird. It's just heavier because okay. you crammed in a neutron. Oh, okay. So it's more dense. Yep. Okay. And isotopes in their reactions and their involvement in chemistry pretty much can substitute for the simplest form of the, of the element. So deuterium can substitute. So let's take water, H2O, right? We normally think of that H as the simple H, one proton, one electron, and two of those combine with oxygen to form a water molecule. But you know what? Deuterium can do it too. So deuterium, let's, if we call it D, and this is where kind of it gets tricky because people are trying to track, okay, you call protium H, you call deuterium D. But so you can have two protium and oxygen to make a water molecule. You can have a protium plus a deuterium plus oxygen make a water molecule, or you can have two deuterium plus oxygen and make a water molecule. So there's three kinds of water molecules in a glass of water. Interesting. And the water molecules that are just made out of two protium, the simple hydrogen and oxygen, we call that light water. And if one of the atoms of hydrogen happens to be a deuterium, where science strictly calls that semi-heavy water. And if we have another water molecule made of two deuterium and an oxygen, we call that heavy water. In everyday science, if it has deuterium in the water molecule, it's just called heavy water, even if it's only one deuterium or two deuterium. Okay, so... So they react differently. Uh, no one realized this at the beginning because we're used to, hey, if the isotopes can exchange for one another, but in reality, uh, they do act differently in chemical reactions such as might occur in, in the body. Now, at the beginning when deuterium was discovered, really nobody paid attention to its biological implications. Partly because in the world's water, and all the world's water contains some heavy water, there's only about six drops in every liter. And pretty much everybody said, that's good. No big deal. Six drops out of, I think a liter is about 30,000 drops. Okay. No big deal. But scientists went crazy over heavy water because heavy water with deuterium in it could slow down neutrons like nothing else. And where did they want to slow down neutrons? In a nuclear reactor because that's how oh, you make it work. Wow. And then, so we're talking deuterium discovered in 1930s. What? At the end of the 30s, everybody's thinking of war. <laughs> Correct. Nobody's getting along. And the Germans, physicists like Heisenberg, the geniuses of that field, if I can make a nuclear reactor, Herr Hitler, I can make something that you're going to like called an atomic bomb. But we have to make the reactor first. And then I can blow up London. Okay, that was Hitler's objective. So he said, what do you need? He said, we need something called heavy water. Water that has deuterium atoms in it. But how do we get it? Well, no one's making it. Except for a plant that's making it for research purposes in, or in Norway. And it was very simple. Go take over the plant. <laughs> And get them to make us all the heavy water that you need. And do it peacefully or aggressively. It doesn't matter. We need it. And so a, a neat thing for your audience is there is a Netflix movie called The Heavy Water War. That is extremely well acted. 
with British actors, Norwegian actors, American actors. It, it is a masterpiece, The Heavy Water War. And it's about this whole drama associated with who could make the first atomic bomb because it all depended on one thing, who could come up with enough heavy water. So no one ever was even thinking about biology. It was about destroying biology, really. So America did win the heavy water war only because we, we blew up that plant, as you'll find out, something like three or four times. Okay? And it, it just exhausted the Germans. So we won the war, et cetera, et cetera. But off to the side after the war, when we really were excited about atomic energy and all this stuff and more nuclear reactors, the Russians were busy going, I wonder what this deuterium stuff does to living things, okay? And so uh, it, it, it started um, with their research and an incident that happened at Tomsk University with some gerontologists. And we happened to actually have written the story in this brief history of deuterium depleted water. Oh, no way. Cool. And this can be downloaded for free from, from uh, drinklightwater.com, our website. Lightwater.com? Drink drinklightwater.com. L-I-T-E, right? L-I-T-E, yes. Yeah. Drinklightwater.com. Right. You can get the history of deuterium. Okay. So um, this history involved the gerontologist not finding out that there is a group of people in Siberia, a culture, Remote people, like people who live in the Himalayas, et cetera, who, who have many, 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 many times more people in their population who live over 100 than the rest of the Russians. And they were just curious. Uh, you know, what is, that's what gerontologists do, right? Find out why people live long or, or short. And they investigated it for almost 10 years. All the things you would think of, you know, the diet, the, the social conditions, their religion, et cetera, et cetera. But nothing panned out for their extreme um, longevity in terms of numbers of people. When it was further looked into, when they couldn't like break the code, why are these people have this characteristic? They found out that they lived incredibly longer as well. And because they didn't have hospitals and things, there weren't good birth records, but they were north of 140 years old. What? Yeah. Whoa. And, and, and women had children in their 60s. I mean, they did not know. They thought this was very normal. Because if you live to 140, that probably there's nothing wrong with having a baby at 60, right? So this became more intriguing. And then someone said, hey, you've looked at everything, but did you consider the isotopic aspect of their water, meaning what isotopes were made up the water. Well, no one was even thinking that in those days, really. It was so new. And so they said, okay, there's these two isotopes. Let's go check. And, you know, all the water we tested has really six drops of the deuterium in it. And we're going to check out their water. And they checked it out and it was more like four drops. Okay. And they said like, like no way. Six drops, four drops. But these people had this water from birth till death. They didn't know any different. But how did they get the water? The water, deuterium can be separated from the lighter isotopes in meteorological phenomenon, like in the freezing cycles in the mountains. 
you know, where you start to have water freeze and, 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 and deuterium freezes at a higher temperature or more easily. So it preferentially freezes and, and then the other water doesn't freeze and it drips down the mountain and they use that for their drinking water. And the, the cows eat it and the yaks eat it and the children, it's, it's in the breast milk of the mothers. So when you get this four drops instead of six drops for a lifetime, it does this wild thing to longevity. Bingo, the Russians are off to the races and they're going, oh my God, we, we really discovered something significant. And then they brought it back to the laboratory and they said, okay, we're going to do experiments on, on, on this heavy water itself. You know, what, what does it really do? We only had six drops before, but now we're going to take that heavy water those guys are using to make atomic uh, reactors. And we're going to see, like, what if, what if you drink it? Okay. Well, don't drink it. Okay. <laughs> um, so, I mean, they took like, you know, instead of six drops... Uh, maybe they did 500 drops. So they had like, they made water 5% deuterium, uh, you know, not 0.5%, but 5%, 10%, 20%, 30% deuterium water. And it looks just like water. It tastes just like water. All right? Nothing unique. At 30%, the deuterium was put on, what do you do first? I mean, that's what I would do. Let's, let's put it on seeds. Let's germinate seeds with it. One of the most fundamental things. And that I'm thinking of it because tomorrow there's going to be this microgreens thing where you start with a bunch of little seeds and you put the water on it. And so it just came up for me. So the, they put it on the seeds, but the seeds never grow. Okay? And then they said, well, Jesus... Okay, let's then, let's get regular healthy plants and let's put it on the plants. And the plants died in a short time with stuff that looks just like water and tastes just like water. And then they said, well, geez, maybe we, let's, let's see what happens when we put it, we use it for the water for the mice and other laboratory animals. And most didn't make it over five days. And bingo, it became an incredibly big deal. Just for your information, the only thing really different about heavy water, where it's perhaps 30% or more, is that if you make ice out of it, it sinks to the bottom. It doesn't float on top. In fact, I'm going to check. <laughs> Check your iced coffee. <laughs> Check the deuterium level. Yep, your ice is floating. You're My good. ice is floating. I'm good. But you know, if if you know, if an estranged person in your life happens to hand you a glass of water and the ice is on the bottom, okay, I'm just warning you now. I wouldn't drink it. All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna let you have your your drink there. So this is um, this is getting interesting. Thank and you. I, I, I knew that you were going to be knowledgeable about this, but I had no idea you would understand the history of it. And this is really cool because when I did the episode some years ago, which is kind of one of the things that you and I bonded on when we first met was that episode. Um, there wasn't a lot of talk about the history. It was just more about the biological element, which we're going to get into. So this is really fascinating. Yeah. Okay, so It's, it's a, a very interesting discovery that almost no one knows about. So what is next in the journey of this light versus heavy water. So the Russians really said, wow. And there was a point, at least we were told stories, uh, uh, when we went, uh, a partner of mine, Viktor Sagalovsky, who happened to have been born in Russia, but lives in the United States, and he's a scientist guy like me. Um, we both said, uh, uh, Victor, you know about the term depleted water? Yeah, I've been following it for years. I have two. Really interesting. And, and it seems like there's a couple of articles coming out on it. Okay. When are we going to Moscow? We're going next month. And we did. We went to Moscow and we met, arranged meetings with all the scientists, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And we got to know 
the inside story. And the Russians were more advanced in it than, than anybody, largely because they kept it a secret. <laughs> okay. And there was talk, we were told, that the Russians realizing that deuterium is a toxic substance to biological entities, okay, plants and animals. It also takes care of bacteria too. Um, that this could become something that would enhance the Russian population. Okay? I mean, what if we could take this poison out? Would that be something that would enhance the health, longevity, etc. of our population? And Russians have always had trouble with their population. And I really don't, we never got a good answer, like, why didn't they follow through on it? Maybe only, maybe only the rich and famous one would do it. But the bottom line probably was it's so expensive to make. It's so cumbersome to make to this day. And much hasn't changed since even the, the 60s that um, it, it's not very practical. And today, there's only enough made by all the players, and there's three or four players, okay? There's only enough made for less than 40,000 people, all right? And for, that wouldn't even supply New York City by a long shot, right? So it's not a big business item at this point because it's so hard to make. In terms, in terms of taking you know municipal water or spring water and creating deuterium depleted water or light water what are we talking about in terms of volume if i take 10 gallons of normal water that's laden with this deuterium and i want to <laughs> create a net of okay so it's not a volume thing remember there's only six drops of deuterium in a liter Okay, so it's you're like, going to take the six drops out, and you got the whole liter. Out. Okay, it's hard to get those six drops out. I see. Okay. okay, so it's it's very cumbersome in terms of the energy needed to do it. Then the energy, the technology, the mechanisms, uh, the, the the optimization of the process is is take took years, and it's done with a process. We might as well say something called fractional distillation rectification and it's a it's um it's it's a form an exotic form of distillation in which you have a very tall column much higher than the ceiling here like 60 or 70 feet high and maybe it's a tube 10 inches on diameter filled with some magic kind of media that helps break surface tension and does a lot of other uh chemo like things to the forces of water and and the water was slowly heated and the lighter molecules of water just slowly ramble through this magic media and up to the top you condense it and it drips out and maybe you make 20 liters in 24 hours oh my god wow okay. wow very laborious so you yeah. have you have you have rooms filled with these columns and the obviously the capital expense is very lot. You don't get a lot of product out of it, etc. Not to mention water is expensive to ship around. So and water is expensive yeah. to ship. Uh, so, like I said, there's enough produced for about forty thousand people in the world, and um, so it's you know a, a small a small group of biohackers who pretty much are on it, and some very key athletes. It it, it changes the entire metabolic scene of an organism. And that's what we should talk a little okay. bit about. Before we go into this as a health practice, I'm curious, since hydrogen in general is the, the main substrate in the known universe that matter is created from, as you indicated in the very beginning... Mm -hmm then this deuterium version of hydrogen would be present in almost everything. And from what I understand, uh, it's more prevalent in 
uh, certain types of foods like uh, carbohydrate foods, sugary foods, things like that versus um, not much present in, in fat, like a mm-hmm. coconut oil or uh, lard, butter, et cetera, Correct. would be low deuterium. But not by, not by more than 10 or 15%. Uh, okay. okay. It's not like one thing contains 10 times more. N- not at all. Does it seem it's over exaggerated? It, okay, because it seems like uh, in the environment, you know, would ocean water then be the highest in deuterium? Not the highest, but it's higher. So regular water, almost anywhere on Earth, regular fresh water is six drops per liter, and that's we call that in science about one hundred and fifty parts per million where one part per million is the same in science as milligrams per liter. Okay. So it's 150 parts per million. Everyone, because you are mostly water that was gotten from the water you drink and the coffee at Starbucks and, and water here in Mexico, that's all 150. Your body water is 152. Okay. Got it. Okay. So everybody here is would be plus or minus a few points north or south of 150. The ocean water will be 155, roughly. Okay. Okay. So if we've been drinking regular water our whole life, we're born in 1970, 80, 90, whatever, and we're drinking that water as the as the basis of all water in our diet, and then say we're also eating processed foods and foods laden with sugar, carbohydrates, etc. Would that all contribute to the burden of of deuterium in our body, or is it yes. really the water that has the biggest? It impact? would not only contribute to this the general burden, but it would be tougher. This extra deuterium, especially in foods that are going to be burned through phosphorylated uh, oxidation uh, in the mitochondria. It's going to be rough on that too, because deuterium encumbers oxidative phosphorylation is the word. I, I have no idea what that means anyway. So okay, that's, no one will notice. <laughs> that, that, that's how that's how the mitochondria burns your food to make energy, and energy is ATP. Got it. That process is the only reason you can blink your eyes or run a one hundred meter dash. It is everything, and science is beginning to recognize biology. Physiology is beginning to realize it is the every only all. It, it, it is running the show of everything. If you have the energy, your body is intelligent enough to do almost anything. And that is becoming the problem, is that we are becoming our mitochondria are encumbered in many ways. One, from aging. Uh, most of the free radicals are produced in the mitochondria, and you have to deal with that. But we're dealing with a lot of other free radicals, and you don't always take care of that. So your mitochondria are stressed, and um, they reduce from about 25 on in a straight line curve to uh, end of life. The number of mitochondria or the, the, number. the ability to produce ATP? Both. Okay. Part of that reason is because it's gnawed away at the mitochondrial mechanisms are, gnawed, are, are, are eaten away by the deuterium. And I'll explain how that happens in a second, but your bodies, your mitochondria, are uh, when they receive a high deuterium in the molecules of, let's say, uh, that they're going to burn, okay, in the Krebs cycle, et cetera. The Krebs cycle, for those of you who know, uh, is, occurs, exists in the mitochondria, and it prepares the energy cycle to make your ATP. So uh, it, it, it is intelligent enough to know that deuterium is a problem. And here's why. It's probably through evolution. Uh, 
that many forms of life found ways to cleverly, some scientists say, shuttle away deuterium from these key processes, okay? Because they're going to be a problem. In the mitochondria, we actually have a mechanism that's called the ADP, ATP synthase nanomotor. Okay, I mean, it sounds kind of crazy. I mean, isn't that in your Porsche? Okay, <laughs> but, 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 it's, but, but it's very similar. It's like a turbo. And it's a turbo made of amino acids. This and is it, in the mitochondria. This in, in the mitochondria, okay. in this thing called the electron transport chain, blah, blah, blah. And it's after the, the, the metabolic pathways are, are, are uh, further down the road. So it's preparing all this stuff to be making ATP in this electron transport chain. But the, the key ingredient are protons. That's what go, are going to be kind of taken into the nanomotor and shuttled down into the ATP production system. But some of those protons... If you're drinking and consuming water, as we all are, with deuterium, the protons aren't alone. Some of them are coming with a neutron. Okay? And think it's like when the proton and the neutron hit the nanomotor. It's like tossing a quarter into your Porsche turbo. Okay? I don't have to explain anymore. It's graphic enough. It it actually damages the nanomotor. And then a few more damages and it's over. Mitochondria done. And that's the loss. And this is the effect of being overly laden with mitochondria. Not overly. That's how it is. Just the normal. That's from the water on the earth. This is how it ended up. And the deuterium on the earth wasn't constant. Okay. Because largely because of ice ages, remember the deuterium freezes first, so it's going to be taken away out of the environment for maybe a couple hundred million years or something, and then it's going to come back again, and that's affected life and evolution. It's not been figured out yet, but the takeaway for your audience is that there's no question that the presence of deuterium in the water we consume in everything largely determines the human lifespan that's wild uh okay where do i want to go with this there's (laughs) (laughs) you want to drink a deuterium deplete there's there all right there there's so much to this so okay so if we're inhibiting the the potential functionality of the mitochondria yes by gumming up the nanomotor that produces atp with this deuterium beautifully said and this isn't a toxin like a you know a mercury or something that we can chelate out and right. get rid of, right. uh, and it's not something that can be filtered out like fluoride in water or something like that. Right. What's so fascinating about this is that the way to get deuterium out of your body is to just drink water that is deuterium free, ar- that is artificially low right. in deuterium, or Find a good, long-lasting job in Antarctica, which has the <laughs> lowest natural deuterium on the planet. Okay, that does not sound fun. Maybe cheaper than buying, the, you know, the depleted well, water. It's not 150 parts per million or 155 like the ocean. It's 89. Wow. And it's the only place on Earth that exists like that. Because through the hydrological cycle and all of that, the deuterium has been depleted over time. Freezing, thawing, all that. So it is thought, but it could be, and it's uncannily low. You know, for all I know, the ETs did it. Right. (laughs) Okay. So uh, there are ways uh, of testing water in in labs, right? Where you can take the water you're drinking and determine, is it, you know, is it 150? Is it 155? Is it 139? So the water that I've been drinking for a few years in in Los Angeles, which I'm terribly uh, distraught about abandoning as I move to Austin, by the time this comes out, I will have done so. Uh, That water I had tested and it came out at 139 parts per million, which from what I understand is pretty decent as far as the world's uh, water supply goes. are you saying that water came from your tap? No, no, no. This is uh, a live spring water from Oregon. 
okay. the site that I sent you a couple of weeks ago. Yes, that water I sent it into the the, the lab and uh, came back at one thirty nine, which was I so think pretty good. That's eleven parts per million less than the regular water almost everywhere on Earth, and that's pretty good. But that's still not low enough to no. trigger your body into the depletion. No. No. So give us the threshold of this, you know, the the ppm of what you would call light water mm -hmm. uh, that's been manufactured in this plant through this laborious, right. complicated, expensive process. What ppm do you have to drink to then trigger your body to start Okay, so getting it's rid a little it? more tricky. So first, we already the Russians already learned that if it's only 130 ppm Okay, that's the roughly four drops I said. That was the water in Siberia, 130 ppm. If you were, had been able to, to take it from birth till death, if it was in your mother's breast's milk and the, the cow's milk from the farm, etc., uh, that would have provided almost all the benefits that we could even dream of on the longevity, anti-aging, beautiful skin, hair, the whole thing. But, but you and no one in this room has that chance anymore, okay? So it doesn't have to be so depleted if you get it early on in life. So it is said that when you're an adult and you are not encumbered by any, let's say, serious chronic disease and cancer and so on, and you don't need special care, that getting your endogenous deuterium below 120 is a major step in improving your life, your likelihood of having adding years to your life, the likelihood of not getting a chronic disease, you know, including cancer, et cetera. So that would be the first shot. You'd like to get below 120. And, and you can test your own levels as I've done using uh, saliva. Yes. Saliva testing where you can find out, you know, what your PPM is. Correct. The interesting thing about it to me, I think that would be good to get clarity on is since this isn't something you can go sweat out in a sauna, like, oh, I need to detox deuterium, like you could, uh, you know, another right. toxin. How does getting water that has less deuterium in it into your, your water regimen and diet, how does that then signal the body or assist the body in, in offloading deuterium? And where does it come out? Do you pee it out or? Yeah, I mean, through all the all elim excretory okay. sweating because you're just a vessel and you have 150 parts per million in. And, and if you were just a tank, okay, and, then, and let, a gallon out each day, if you put in water without deuterium, it, it's going to get less because it's mixing and diluting the tank. Okay, that makes it, sense. It's really that basic. You have an uncanny ability to explain really complicated things simply. Thank you for that. Okay. Uh, so let's say someone is not dealing with chronic disease because there is some research uh, specifically around cancer and deuterium depletion. Yes. And, you know, of course, you, we all have to be careful talking about these things we because do. of the Illuminati-controlled... Um, F <laughs> FDA. <laughs> I didn't say that. Is no, that all uh, who controls? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Who knows? Who knows, right? Um, but let's say someone's, you know, is is not terminally ill and just wants to optimize, and they want to be what you're in your set. What are you seventy six now? Yeah. You can outrun me. You've proven that the first night we met in London. You, I couldn't even. I had to jog to keep up with your walking, and I'm not even kidding. Um, so let's say someone is just interested in performance and longevity and they're they're well healed enough to afford this water, right. which, uh, you know, as you said, is rare and hard to afford. Um, what would be a, a PPM that they could drink for a period of time that would be, you know, uh, pretty aggressive in helping them well, get start, rid of deuterium? Me, you know, I would probably start out if you have a good, good habits and, and, and can maintain them. If you run a tight ship, 115 to 120 parts per million. And is the higher PPM deuterium depleted water less expensive than... Yes, absolutely. It's, so it's not worth, from us, our, our approach, it's not worth making different PPMs for people because it, it's, it becomes like a warehouse craziness. Oh, right, so, right. So the water that I'm... I guess I can show these now. We actually make two kinds of water. Th 
this is our main stay. This is a two liter bottle of 10 parts per million. Oh, damn. Okay. And this is kind of our, our, um, holy grail. This is five PPM. Okay. And it's in a glass bottle, but most people get this because it's more economical and uh, something I didn't know. It's crazy to have to ship glass bottles from Russia. I want you to know. Yeah, I, I can only imagine. They don't all make it for one thing, okay? Yeah, yeah. and I'll, I mean, shipping empty glass bottles from Russia would probably be astronomically <laughs> expensive. So let's say somebody takes a liter of the 10 parts per million. Let's say I have my Alive Spring Water. I always give them a shout out because I, I want them to grow so they can deliver to Austin eventually. <laughs> um, let's say uh, I have a, you know, a great, high Rocky Mountain spring water source that's it's a low, say a 140 ppm. And I want to continue to drink that because I, I I can't afford to drink, you know, 10 parts ppm. So could you take a you know a 10 parts per million deuterium depleted and dilute regular drinking water? Precisely. And you end up with a 120 or 110 or whatever. Exactly. So if I mix this one to one, in other words One part of this, and it could be one bottle, one liter, one pint, okay? If I mix one part with this with one part regular tap water at 150, you're going to have a little lower one, but Mm -hmm. let's make believe what everyone here has, 150, I'll get 80 parts per million. And you really don't have to, if unless you're working on a special condition or something, you don't need to do 80. It will cause your body to deplete faster, but it will cost you more. You'll be paying a higher price. Got it. If we mix this one part to two parts, that's 103 parts per million. Which is still less than any natural water on earth except for Antarctica. If we mix this with one part to three parts, we will have 115 parts per million. Yours would come out like maybe 112 with your 140 ppm water. And if you mix one part with four parts, you get 122. Yours would come out to be about exactly 120. Okay. So that's how you do it. So this for you, if you were to just say, oh, you know, Rob, I'm going to start out with the 120. So this two liter bottle would end up making uh, uh, let's see, four, 10 liters oh, wow. of 120 parts per wow. for you. Wow. Okay. And then it just gets, if he's not rushing his depletion, it gets to be at, at, at three to one or four to one. It's like a visit to Starbucks, really. It's nothing exotic. <laughs> Did you test your deuterium levels before you started oh, drinking sure. the water and very recently? And what's the difference and where are you so, right now? I mean, I, I was almost like 150 on the nose and now I'm about 100. And it's... More difficult for me, and, and, and it would be for you, we travel. I mean, I try to bring maybe maybe one or two of these with me. Sometimes I can't. Uh, and, and then you run out. I don't always have this. And then I break the rules too. A glass of wine has deuterium in it, and, and I'm not giving up my glass of wine. <laughs> so what I do to compensate just on the fly If I have a glass of wine or two glasses of wine, I'll take like an espresso glass of this den just to compensate. So the glass of wine would be 150 parts per million, roughly. If a a woman uh, wanted to uh, get pregnant and have the healthiest baby possible, would they, and let's just assume they're going to be at 150 parts per million in their saliva, in their body's water, uh, could one go more aggressively for a no, short period of time? I wouldn't equate this with uh, procreation and having babies and getting pregnant. Okay. Too little is known. Okay. Okay. Too little is researched and written about. It It is thought by some that this slowing down of reactions um. It, it, caused by deuterium 
but just think of it as heavier and it moves slower, okay? Even though that's not very scientific. That this... Um, this could in, this could encumber things that are needed during fetal formation. Got so it. So we right. just, hey, nobody knows enough. Don't do it. Do your normal thing. Have pure water. Uh, and 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 frankly, if if you said, hey, could you have even one hundred and thirty parts per million? There are people who do it on. 130 parts per million in history with no adverse effects. So maybe that would be, but I, you'd never take like a low PPM in preparation for having a child. Well, interestingly enough, I just remembered something that I learned in my first interview about this, but that is when, uh, when mammals are growing, they're much higher in deuterium that when you're younger, do you know about this? That, no. That, yeah, I think that, um, uh, Dr. Uh, Laszlo, or, or Boros. Boros. Yeah, Boros. Which one's the first name? Which Laszlo was Laszlo Boros. Laszlo Boros. Yes, thank you. It's been a while. Uh, he was explaining that um, youngsters are actually higher in deuterium, and in nature, you would start to deplete that deuterium. And when uh, plants are in their growth cycle, for example, they're much higher in deuterium versus when they're kind of uh, more in remission mm-hmm. or just holding well, plants, steady. You know, plants also, I mean, leafy plants actually, right from the beginning, do shuttle deuterium out in. In, into their their higher sugar containing parts, like maybe their root or something. So leafy greens are known to have lower deuterium than regular water. Right, right, and that's good. So and 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 fruits are higher in deuterium because the plant is kind of shuttling the deuterium to where the sugar is going. You know, whether it be the root, a sweet potato or a regular potato, where the carbohydrates going. Right. So how important do you think if someone really is, you know, kind of getting into some advanced biohacking, anti-aging stuff, and they're going to really tackle the deuterium thing, how important do you think the uh, low carb, low sugar diet is in the equation um, versus just kind of eating a healthy, organic, you know, regular diet and adding in the water? Because- When I interviewed Boros, he was like, you got to be totally keto and be fat adapted and drink the water. Otherwise, it it, it doesn't work as well or something like that. I mean, frankly, you can really overcome almost anything because the deuterium levels with carb versus fats and so on. I mean, it's not really the deuterium level. It's how the body uses that, that food group, whether it's be a fat. So the fat would do much better in the mitochondria for getting rid of the deuterium, but it's not, you could overcome anything with just the water. Got it. And it just gets to be more expensive. (laughs) Okay. 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 That's good. Cause when I went through, I I think I was at, uh, around 146 or something in uh in my first test i did maybe three months of the water and got down to uh 126 something like that really um yeah yeah and in a pretty short period of time wow and you were just by diet uh no i was doing the water oh okay yeah, i was doing the water but i also was conscious about the diet but then after a while you know i got lazy and inertia kicked in and i went back to ice cream you know what i mean yeah uh, so I'd be curious now after, like, did it stick? So I guess the next thing is if someone d- does a round of depletion and they do the water and they are somewhat mindful about their diet and not eating, you know, just constant carbs and sugar, high in deuterium, do you then just reaccumulate it and, and get your levels back up? So, you do. Okay. So this is kind of a, a lifestyle choice that one wants to commit to Absolutely. on an ongoing basis if they are serious about this particular thing. And while you're on that, I might as well show you how people test their deuterium. Oh, cool. This is a little test kit that that we would send to you. And this is kind of a little plastic syringe kind of thing with a um, sponge here. And you basically pool saliva in the lower part of your jaw and you push this down and suck out the saliva into the sponge and then you deposit that saliva and fill this little test tube 
Got it. And then this goes in and it's put in a uh, deuterium analyzer, a very expensive, uh, challenging instrument to, to maintain and, you know, calibrate. Uh, and it measures uh, the deuterium in the saliva. And have you subjectively noticed a huge difference in your energy production uh, as a result of adopting this? Yes. Is and, that why you? Use, is use, that why you could outrun me so yes. easily <laughs> at yes. seventy six? Yeah. The I mean, it, it was almost when I first went on it. It was it was almost like silly. Okay. And I got to a point. Uh, I mean, this is really going to seem silly. Like if I went to, let's say if I went to Costco, I had so much energy naturally, like every minute waking up the whole thing. I had so much energy that I ended up parking in the furthest parking place. Okay. And I would run to the front door. It felt so natural and so easy and it still does. And I'm just wondering, God, I, I would think, God, I hope he's, nobody sees me and knows that I'm 76 years old. <laughs> they think I've lost <laughs> They're going to be like, sir, sir, take it easy. <laughs> yeah. And then when I got my Costco basket, I would run back to that car, maneuvering around people. You know, it's a busy parking lot. And, and it was like, holy mackerel. I mean, this, you feel like kind of a kid. And I don't know. It's, I don't, it, it's like if you're healthy, and you're older like me, you are going to have some energy that you do not remember having for a long time. All right, let's get down to brass tacks. <laughs> how, how, because now I'm like, I want some of this damn water. So for one of these 10, uh, these 10 parts per million uh, larger bottles that you could then, as you indicated with your great math skills, which shows you're cognitively doing pretty well, much better than I at this point, um, or maybe you're just born with it, so we could dilute, as you said, you know, we right. could make 10 of those liters with one liter and still be doing pretty well. Yes. Um, how much brass no, tax? No, we'd make 10 liters with two liters. Sorry. Okay. So that's two liters and we make 10. Right. How much is one of those bottles So from, from you guys? Yeah, I know there's yeah. a couple of companies so, so, out there. So this is sold. I mean, it's really the, the uh, because we have the lowest in the world. We don't have to ship you so much. That that's it. Really helps because shipping water. There's nothing worse than shipping water. Okay. Yeah. So one, we only do this by subscription. We make exceptions for certain people, but we really want people to not uh, like dabble in this. We know what it's capable of, and there's such a shortage. We want everybody to benefit. To its full potential. So you have a subs we give a script subscription. You have to buy two packages of four of these bottles. That's eight two liter bottles. That is per month. And that should get anyone through this, uh, through a month. Okay. And they can cancel at any time and we make it easy, but we want that commitment because we want them to to be serious. And that package is $160 each package. So, so you're looking So a one month supply 160 bucks for one package. So Okay. But they buy two to okay. make it through. Got it. Okay, got it. And that person if they were uh doing the high level like I told you 122, they could probably uh get by with that for one and a half months, okay, with a high dilution. But I'd say the preponderance of our customers may not be in the best health and they're looking for this for a health reason. And two four-liter packages is just about right for a month supply to replace all the water. That's what the rule is. You have to replace all. When I say all, at least 90%. That means... You know, no more Starbucks visit. You're going to lose some things because you have to make your coffee with water. You have to make your tea with water. Um, people who go, who buy almond milk or macadamia milk, you've got to make your own or else it's going to take you a long time. 
It's going to take you much longer to get your levels down exactly. because you're just putting it and, right and back in. And you're wasting money by, by doing that. Got it, got it. So uh, after three months, we give a discounted deuterium test, severely discounted, to show them how well they've done. Yeah, see that I like. I like when you can test stuff. Yes. So oftentimes I spend a lot of money on supplements and the gadgets. And I, you know, I think it's just because I'm in the business and I'm so curious. I do so many things. People say, oh, did that thing work? Does right. this work? I'm like, it's tough to isolate what thing's working. I just feel better all the time and I get sick less and I'm right. in a good mood and I'm happy. And that's the goal, right? Right. But I really liked when I did the deuterium before. I said, oh, shit, my levels are really high. Did this water for a couple months. Spent quite a lot of money on it. I think more than what you just described. Right. Actually, quite a bit more. Uh, but it was an experiment. Then I tested, the levels were down. I thought, I win. You know, it's quantifiable. So I, I like that part of it, especially when you're going to drop some coin. You know, yeah. it's like, I mean, you want to know have, it's working. We have three warehouses, one on the East Coast, one in Reno, and one in Los Angeles. So that combination with the fact that they can dilute this water so much. The yeah. next best water is 25 parts per million, okay, from a competitor. and Almost all the competitors, we don't even know why, actually ship directly from Europe, okay? Nobody really warehouses it like we do right here in the States. So it all adds up to probably the most reasonably priced deuterium depleted water that is available in, in North America. Got it. Okay. Next question. Uh, obviously, we talked about shipping glass, problematic very impractical. So we've got this water in plastic bottle. Yes. Uh, it's, it's a, they call it the best is the recycle grade pet BPA and BPS free. So as far as, that's ours. as far as plastic goes, you've got the best plastic available. available. Okay. Now I do, people often, you know, really object to plastic. They're very sensitive to the idea. They want it in glass. And some people do, some very celebrities want the glass at all costs. I tell people you live, here's what I, my, my thinking, you live in a sea of plastic. The carpet in your house is plastic. The paint is plastic, full of plasticizers. All the appliances are plastic. You get in your car, it's a tomb of plastic. Okay. <laughs> and for the contribution of any plastic molecules that you get from the bottle you're drinking water up it wouldn't show up on the list, okay? Right. In the quantity. I just think about, I I, 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 you know where I notice plastic a lot is in the microfibers. You know, if you look around the average home, every blanket, sweaters, clothes. Of course. You know, it's just like if if you had a microscope in every room and you just looked at the air from just having that shit in there. It's, you really do live in an atmosphere in a sea of plastic. Yeah, okay. Fair enough, fair enough. Uh, would there be any risk to say, I want to just go hardcore and I had the coin for it. I just start drinking 10 ppm every day, all day. That's all I do, undiluted. Uh, is there any uh, risk in like pushing the system that you're aware of where your body's like, whoa, depleting too much, too fast, freak out, meltdown? We only had one person who did this with, with other deuterium depleting um, uh, activities, you know. Infrared saunas and so on. There's there's a, a bunch of things to help your body get rid of deuterium, and um, I I it I can only conclude it's probably not the best idea to go full on the lowest ppm. Just you know, I, I've had a great time with one to one, and that's even lower than I would need. Got it. To going to one to one. Okay. So you know that's probably the best I. I would do. Okay. Fair enough. All right. Uh, in the interest of uh, time with our studio audience here, how you guys hang? You guys hanging in? Okay. <laughs> so hard, it's so hard to gauge because I've never had a studio audience. I don't think maybe, I mean, I have had a couple events where we just made a podcast out of it, but I've never had an actual podcast. So I'm like, oh, there's people over here. What are you guys doing? This is creeping me out. Um, but I do want to cover the other hydrogen. And it's funny because when we started I didn't even realize we're actually just talking about hydrogen, hydrogen the whole time. But in terms of supplementation, you know, when people ask me, and I think that's why I love talking to you, what are the three top supplements or practices you would do? And it's, it's always difficult. And, and I always say for the record uh, that 
to me, the best biohacks and health practices are free. Number one, prayer and meditation, sun gazing, sun exposure, breath work. I mean, you do that. And grounding. You, grounding. Yeah. Yeah. You know, all that. Uh, hot therapy, cold therapy, ice baths. Right. You commit to that as a lifestyle. You probably Incredible. won't need stuff in organic food, you know, all that, right? Incredible. You probably won't need supplements. But since most of us humans are lazy, we would rather take the pill than wake up at 6 a.m. and sun gaze and ground and do all the things. So if I was pressed, I have to say, in just in terms of what my body responds to and the benefits, I would be Quinton Sea Minerals, which we covered Absolutely. in another uh, episode, just the fundamental building blocks of biology. Uh, and, you know, again, people can learn about that in a two hour conversation we did before. And uh, the next one would be deuterium de de depleted water. I mean, it just is. I'm not kissing your ass because you're here and these are things you're really into, but know. you really zeroed in on the three things. And the other one is molecular hydrogen, the hydrogen tablets. Right. I feel really good when I'm doing that on a regular basis. And that is something I absolutely do every single day, the Quinton and the hydrogen tabs. And, uh, and the hydrogen has even taken on a greater significance since the coronavirus pandemic. Okay. Because hydrogen plays a very big role. And I'm not even sure you know Interesting. in the attenuation uh, of COVID and coronavirus. Interesting. No, I did not know that. Yep. Uh, so way back in the day, and we'll put this in the show notes, I did a super geeky, very high science- With Tyler. With Tyler LeBaron. You know, uh, He's great. Who's just a really bright guy. Right. I mean, he's running circles around me the whole time. I'm just like, okay, say that again, you know, kind of interview. Um, but that was, that was some years ago. And I think a lot of people that listen to the podcast are- are uh, tuned into the hydrogen thing, but turns out, which I didn't know until I got to know you a bit, that you were really the guy that brought this molecular hydrogen product in that um, you know effervescent tablet form to market. Correct. So in 2010. In 2010, and uh, how did you discover that this most prevalent substance uh, in the universe, as as hydrogen and it's the form that we want that has biological benefits? How did you first discover you could make a pill that makes hydrogen gas that you could get in your body? It was out of ignorance, frankly, because I wasn't seeking hydrogen. I was seeking electrons in the water. Oh, okay. Okay. And I was wrong. And so were many before me who used other methods. Everyone thought that the oxidation reduction potential was the key. If you could lower ORP, which reflected electron activity in the water, okay, making it from oxidative to reductive solution. So taking a, like a high oxid, oxidant water and making it an antioxidant water, exactly, right? Because I used to have a Kangen machine way back in the day, and that's one what of, they one of the big selling into. points was the the Precisely. the ORAC score, right? And that's that is another measurement, okay. It's not the, it's oh, not the, the same ORP. as ORP. I'm sorry, ORP. Oh. Right, right. Sorry, sorry. And they yeah. use ORP. Uh, and this was also the position, if you recall, of Patrick Flanagan with his- Right, the mega hydrate. Mega hydrate, mega hydrin. I mean, Do you that like lasted that for 15 years. Um, that should be for another conversation, <laughs> but all I can say is yeah. many people- have benefited that for 15 years. And when something's around and has endured for 15 years, I'll give it, Yeah, go for it. Okay. But th there has been some problem with the ingredients we won't go into Got it. that have complicated the answer to that question. Okay. But I sought out and with the help of uh, a, a co-developer, a way to deliver a low Oxi uh, or a high negative oxidation potential, 500 to minus 500 to 800 millivolts by using the method that did it by generating hydrogen. But we didn't focus on the hydrogen because no one knew in America at the time that it was the H2 molecule that did all the work. We really thought it was the electron, the dump, the presence of electrons. But it ends up being the hydrogen. And that was one of the things that first got Tyler and I together. Got it. So I made the right product in 2010 
with the wrong name. Okay? It was actually called Active H-. minus. Soon to become Active H-2. Okay? So the minus became the H-2, and the rest is one of the more successful uh, health products of our time, really. So when it comes to this idea of antioxidants, right? Because we're being oxidized in our environment. Some of the foods we eat, the air we breathe, everything, right? Is we're basically rusting, essentially. So if I'm going to look for an antioxidant rich food like acai or blueberries, for example, uh, versus drinking a glass of uh, molecular hydrogen gas infused water, I mean, we're talking about a vast... Uh, uh, um, a difference between the potential benefits there, right? I mean, are they even yes, in the same from category? A pure, from a pure standpoint of the reduction of the worst free radical, hydroxyl radical, yes. But don't forget like the acai and the green juice is also having polyphenols, okay? Which are part of the antioxidant, but it also does many other things in the body. Okay. Got it. Okay. That hydrogen wouldn't do. Okay. Hydrogen is a hammer for several things. One is hydroxyl radical um, sequestering or neutralization, whatever you want. And for regulating uh, the uh, antioxidant system, such as catalase, superoxide dismutase, glutathione, it's involved in the regulation of those. It's, it's too complicated a subject to get into. And then it also acts as the all-important signaling molecule that we read more and more about, okay? So like um, signaling molecules, since we're on the subject, been, been on the subject of mitochondria, mitochondria have their own DNA, okay? They, make their, they do their own thing genetically, but they let the DNA in the nucleus know what they're doing. And they do it through signaling molecules that send through the cytoplasm. Okay. Hey, here's what we're doing. Okay. Thank you. You're doing the right thing kind of thing. So signaling molecules are a relatively new kind of awareness of, of scientists and they're very important. And some signaling molecules like uh, 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 like um, nitric oxide, they're free radicals and you need them. So one of the neat things about hydrogen is that other antioxidants like vitamin C and maybe glutathione, et cetera, they, when you take them, especially in a, a volume, they may neutralize or destroy or cancel some valuable signaling molecules. Okay, but hydrogen does not. Oh, that's interesting. It was one of like the big deals. Oh my God, the hydrogen isn't taking down the signaling molecules. So that's one of its neat benefits. Why do I feel so much better when flying when I do uh, hydrogen water? I'll take these tabs. I'll put, I'll put three or four. I mean, it's probably overkill, I'm sure, and I'm wasting money. But uh, I'll put three or four tabs in a bottle of water and just chug that every 90 minutes or so on a flight. And I've literally like, I can't stand flying without it. Because flying is one of the things I struggle with the most in terms of just, it just wrecks me. And I'm always working on fine tuning It's a that. Relatively, relatively newer aspect of hydrogen in that hydrogen in its gaseous form when consumed as infused in water, has a relevance to lung and respiratory function. Oh, wow. In fact, in fact, the place I'm going to go is a strange place. My favorite. That the strange place of Luke's story. When the, the, the Chinese discovered, because they're, they have viral problems too, okay? They may have created them, but they have them. When they combined hydrogen and nitric oxide, it gave like incredible relief to the COVID impairment of respiratory function, okay? So much so, so much so. I mean, I can't believe that we're talking about this. 
that a, a, a beverage researcher who has for the longest time always made, he was fascinated by putting hydrogen in water. Okay. I did it with a tablet, right? But he wanted to make a ready, he was an expert in beverages. He wanted to make a hydrogen beverage. Now, most hydrogen beverages have been a failure because hydrogen goes through everything. Because it's such a tiny molecule. Yeah, it goes. I mean, if this was a glass bottle, there would be nothing in here. Really? Yes. It's so small it goes through glass? Yes, it does. crazy. It goes through everything but aluminum. No way. Why? Okay. Now, are we we going into metallurgy now? Okay, I'm sorry. I just... (laughs) My curiosity takes us in the weeds. I forget why. We just know that. All right. So, so, so there's been a lot of hydrogen products that are in, I don't know, flexible packs. I can't remember what. what yeah, what, I've seen them at the store. Yeah. yeah. Do not get those because there's Noted. almost no, the hydrogen, even though they're aluminized stuff, the seaming and things, the hydrogen just doesn't stay a long time. The only way that is practical to do ready-made infused water hydrogen is to have a can, and it's not even a normal aluminum can, okay? That even in the process of putting the water in this can and then this top is put on, this has to be done with another level of technology to make sure that that seam is flawless. I mean, I mean it's crazy. Wow. But he perfected it. And and he, he made this product that is, he made H2 beverage. H2 Bev is a famous product that's sold. The only really successful canned hydrogen product. And it's great. But he decided when COVID came to make HydroShot. And HydroShot, uh, we're, we're going out on a limb here. HydroShot contains not only H2, but it contains something that generates nitric oxide in the body. Okay? And if you read, and I can't tell you anymore, this is a little miracle worker for one of the problems of our time. Noted. Okay. We'll okay. read between the Noted, lines. sir. <laughs> and the results have been... Among the craziest I have ever seen, meaning its efficacy. And there is even a, a, a companion one to finish the job called Silver Bullet, made by the same company. And this contains zinc and egalocatechins from green tea which has another function and these two together do something that a lot of people who know better can't do. Okay. (laughs) Does the hydrogen help shuttle the zinc into the cell? No, 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 no. Hydrogen. This kind of is one part A and part B. Got it. Okay. This is something to note everyone. Seriously. Okay. Really special. Okay. In terms of parts per million, you know, when we're going back to the deuterium conversation, we want as few parts per million in deuterium, that heavy hydrogen. Yes. But in this case, what we're looking for in a hydrogen drink or product is higher parts per million. So when it, higher parts per so million. So when it comes to a, a, a canned version like this or, or the, uh, the active H2 tablets that you guys make and the hydrogen, the countertop hydrogen water machines that have kind of come and gone yes. uh, over the past few years. What is the highest PPM that you can you can get on a regular basis and which one of those versions does it? Uh, most electrolytic electrolysis-based machines, typically like, like an alkaline ionizer, like the Kangen, make less than one part per million. Okay? If you just bubble hydrogen into a glass of water, okay, for some period of time until the hydrogen is saturated in that, it's about 1.6 parts per million. The technology of, and the early tablets did just that, 1.6 parts per million. But some very clever technology was added to my original technology in which 
like nano bubble forms. This is like very high end stuff that that uh, stays in the water longer and kind of disintegrates hydrogen into the water. And this is now this mainstay active H2 product is now between eight and 10 parts per million. And what if you what if you take a tall glass of water and you put like I do sometimes because it just, so 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 that I eight put and ten two or parts, three four tablets in okay. a glass of water so so it will be more but not like straight line more it okay. will just be like you'll reach a plateau okay the water can only contain so much right so um, it's it's probably better to take one and then you know have one a little short time later. Oh, good. Now, when we say that this tablet can make eight to 10 parts per million, the real question is not the, the industry like really got off the track and, and, and kind of took advantage of the public's lack of knowledge. When somebody says, oh, how much does this make? Oh, I just told uh, Luke eight to 10 parts per million, but had Luke known the science, he'd say, well, eight to 10 parts per million in what volume of water? Right, right. Okay? Yeah, yeah. Because that's really the key. And it's really in 10 ounces, technically. Okay. If you made it in 20 ounces, it'd be four to five parts per million. Are you following yeah, me? Yeah, yeah. Really, you have to ask a little more if somebody says PPM. But the industry kind of used it to, I don't know, to sell products where that weren't as good as other products. And we're assuming that more parts per million is better. More parts per million is better. Okay. And it's also made, hydrogen goes through the skin, like 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 it goes through If it can go through bottle. glass, yeah. Yes. Okay. So, so it's even made in, in like for soaking. Uh, in fact... My story is Rubby, the, the greatest one. So it's made in a giant tablet. You might want to take just one of these before you fly now. Yeah, no but doubt. But this is used to put in the bath, okay? These are like horse, horse hydrogen. For those listening, yeah, it's like about the size of a big chewable vitamin yeah. C or something. Yeah. So you put these actually in the bath or you could put it in, let's say you injured your arm, okay? And you put it in a... A bath, the cooler the water, the better, because hot water just makes the hydrogen go away. And you can keep putting these in. So, in my, at, 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 you, maybe I'm physically fit at my age, but I think I'm getting stupider uh, and doing stupid things. So, I went on a run in an, a very rough terrain place with somebody who was an accomplished rough terrain runner. And I went on this run and following him, and he was much younger than I am and much more accomplished. And so, but I knew the terrain better than he was, but he was far more of an athlete than I was. And this happened about two years ago. And there was a place I knew that the very rough, it was going to go down a very steep hill of extreme ruts and so on. And I knew that, or I reasoned that I had seen those ruts more than he has. And so when we were going down, I thought I was going to overtake him. But now imagine a scene from a Roadrunner cartoon, okay? <laughs> that was me. And I tumbled down that hill in an act of stupidity. And I fractured both of my ankles and three ribs. Okay? That's what happened. Ouch. And it was an amazing experience. It was one of the worst accidents I'd ever had because there was a point like five minutes later, I go... God, I don't think anything is broken. And he goes, adrenaline. Oh, no. And then 20 minutes later, I was like screaming. I was off the emergency room. The doctor noted that I was duly stupid looking at my age. Okay. So what I did. So here's, here's, I'm, I'm just having fun with everybody, even though it's true. Um, when I got back to my home in the wheelchair and with crutches, I immediately said, okay, I asked my roommate, set up the table in front of the couch, put my computer on it. I'm going to just work from there on my computer and I'm going to uh, get a plastic bucket or a plastic like tray. I'm going to fill it with water, cool water. I'm going to put, at that time, we only had the little tablets and I just, I like put 20 of them in there. Okay. And I kept my feet in there. 
And I did that day after day, maybe three times a day. And I just, would every once in a while, I had no rules. No one ever told me to do this, but I knew hydrogen is so powerful, you know, transdermally. I threw more tablets in. By three days later, I could walk with no crutches. Okay? Both ankles fractured. I also kept a wet area that I would put in this thing. I, I kept it like pinned to my, my, my three cracked ribs. Okay? And they were feeling good. By the 13th day, I was gently jogging in my community. And when I went back to the doctor, he just goes, I knew I was going to have trouble with you, Mr. Slovak. <laughs> okay. This is not even possible. Okay. And so it went on. Like, what are you doing? Yeah. So hydrogen for this is very powerful for, for healing, you know, impairments, inflama inflammatory conditions. What's the mechanism of action there? You know, because from a simplistic point of view, if you injure yourself. Inflammation, free radical, hydroxyl radical, okay. massive suppression. And the free radicals are damaging your tissue. So this just interferes. Got it. Okay. Okay. So in terms of the uh, health benefits of hydrogen, is there anything, can you use the hydrogen gas, like make the hydrogen water with the tabs? Is there any benefit to adding anything to that? Sometimes I'll put my, you know, my pharmaceutical grade uh, methylene blue in my hydrogen drink because I think, why not? It's kind of the morning tonic, right? When I wake up, I have my spring water and I'll put the hydrogen tabs and I'll put methylene blue in there. Is there any point to doing things okay, like that? So if one of the things I do, if I don't have this, remember this is hydrogen plus a nitric oxide precursor. It happens to use citrulline. citrulline? Oh, okay. Yeah. okay. Yeah. What I do is I also have nitric oxide like beet powder, right? Sure. So I, take, I make something strong. I make my beet powder thing, nitric oxide, and I throw a couple of hydrogen tablets in that and I make my own kind of thing. Got it. Okay. Are you with me? Okay. And I will tell you, this is magic. Now, what we do is something like you're onto. We come by, because... Hydrogen has many, there's like a hundred things hydrogen does. It's kind of crazy, but it also is a metabolic nutrient. So um, metabolic syndrome, precursor to the D. I don't know if we can even use that word. I'm not sure what you can say. Precursor to, to D, Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Metabolic syndrome is a precursor to D. That hydrogen in all of the studies, in, in, in we, it, we did one study with ours, is magical in attenuating metabolic syndrome. Huh. Okay? So we thought, metabolic syndrome, how can we improve that part? So we combined it with chromium, glucose tolerance factor. And this is fantastic product if you have that condition. Cool. So... And what's the uh, Tyler LeBaron's, you know, non-affiliated, non-monetized site, the, the, uh, the molecular hydrogen, hydrogen com. And there is, I mean, oh, go on it, go on it, go on it, go on it. Yeah. Hundreds of studies. I mean, it's insane. It, it is. And, and there's almost nothing that hydrogen doesn't improve. Yeah. So I would, I'd recommend, and I, you know, as I said, we'll put that prior interview in the show notes, but I go on there and my head spins in about five minutes yeah. because it gets pretty dense into the science. But for those listeners that are like, I want to see the proof. I want the science. Uh, yeah, it's, it's all there. I mean, it it's really, it's pretty incredible. Yep. I never dreamed when I first did the hydrogen product in 2000, and I never dreamed it would come to this. Awesome. All right. Well, now is a good point, I think, to take a pause. Uh, and see if we have any of our uh, audience members that want to come up and take a question. Do we have any takers? Okay, cool. Okay, uh, first name and location of residence and then fire away. Uh, my name is Wayne Morris. I'm uh, just outside Killaloo, Ontario, up in Canada. Cool, cool. Have you ever listened to the podcast before? I haven't, but oh. I'm certainly oh, going neat. to start okay, listening. Great. So. Right on. Well, you yeah, better I'm now you're intrigued. on it. I have to. <laughs> All right, cool. What do you got for us? Um, so I'm wondering, you know, we hear about um, 
long, long time ago, and and you know, in, in in kind of a biblical sense, that people lived a lot longer way back. I'm wondering, is was there a point in history, in the Earth's history, where the deuterium levels were lower, and is there any evidence of that? And has it, you know, has it been changing over long periods of time? There are probably nothing more recent than information, perhaps as far back as twenty to thirty thousand years, in which they know the deuterium varied fairly dramatically. But the bulk of evolution was long over, okay? And it appears that many species, plant and animal, had, had, had developed mechanisms to avoid this deuterium, okay? It's apparent from the design of cellular functions. So the answer is like, you know, I've never seen anyone link it biblically except for this. And this is really fringe stuff. Uh, for for even for Luke's uh, <laughs> podcast. Sorry, Luke. No, so, go for it. At More some point in 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 studying and bringing light water to America, someone notified me and, and said, "Oh, Rob, you're into deuterium depleted water." He said, "Have you ever seen what the contactee um, Edward Billy Meyer? Oh, yeah, yeah. Ever said in his." Writings. If those of you who don't know Edgar, Edgar Billy Meyer, he's world famous. I think he's perhaps 90 now. He is a Swiss farmer who produced the most crazy evidence and volumes of brilliant writings about everything from the universe to science that this eighth grade Swiss farmer could not have written, right? But volumes. And it was published. And he goes back as far as like the, the mid 40s in his contact. And he wrote, he even has photographs of flying saucers and so on. And it was always entertaining for me. But he said, Did you ever see what he wrote in 1975 about deuterium? I'm going, He couldn't have. I mean, hardly anybody knew, used the word deuterium in 75 unless you were a physicist. And he goes, here, I'm going to send it to you. And I have it. We, we published it on our website somewhere. And he said that at one, in 1975, he wrote, my, con- my contactee was a Pleiadian female. And, and everyone knows her. And you can go on Netflix or maybe Amazon and see at least one of five Billy Meyer uh, documentaries made. Worth seeing. And so he asks his Pleiadian person uh, how how long do you guys live and she goes my pleiadian group can live about 1000 of your years okay okay and he asked her i recall how how old are you and she said i'm about 300 years old of your years and he goes okay why how come humans have such a short lifespan compared to you and she said without hesitation there's two reasons you have a defective magnetic field. We do. <laughs> On the planetarily speaking. Yes. Okay. And number two, you have a contaminant in all of your water called deuterium. What? what? I'm Crazy. not joking. It's there in writing. That's wild. And he obviously had no idea what deuterium meant. Okay. And I don't even know if he investigated it after that, but that's the first mention of it I saw in this way, historically. Now... 20 years later, there's another famous contactee called Wes Bateman. Wes Bateman is a mathematician, professor, author of multiple books, you know, totally different than Billy Meyer. And he, I don't even know if he followed or even knew that, but he asks his contact, um, how long do you live? I, I, I don't remember what, what they said, but he says, how come li- human lifespan is so short compared to yours? And they only said one thing. You have a contaminant in your water called deuterium. Done. Damn. Okay. So I have a follow-up question to that. So, then. Wow. Does that help? It does. Um, but I'm wondering also, is there some condition that turns proteum into deuterium, whether it's a natural condition or, or is that even None. possible or... It's just... No, it could just... have... I mean, you know, Frank, I'm thinking, could it happen in a nuclear reactor where you're bombarding 
like the cooling water with neutrons. It probably happens, okay? I'm just guessing from my own atomic physics. But not, it, I don't think it could happen in, in, in a, un, unless it was an atomic level thing. Now, could that happen in stars? Absolutely. But, but it just occurs naturally. It's, it, it's, it, it's within the ecosystem of the Earth. No. That would not happen. Where no, no, but, it, but it's turns there. In, huh? Na- it's there naturally, just in, in it's the Earth's there. water. It's yeah. there from the beginning, right. except this <laughs> magical place called Antarctic. And it, and it always has fascinated me. We know we know nothing about Antarctica. We know we're not allowed to know about Antarctica. We know only a few people are even permitted to go there. But when I was, I will say this, this is kind of another little anecdotal thing. When I was determining what deuterium analyzer to purchase, I was investigating the places that had one. And I went to the closest one to where I lived in Lake Tahoe was um, Sacramento State University, where they had a very advanced geophysics department. And I made an appointment and she had one of the famous deuterium analyzers. And uh, thank you. And um, so I went there for a training and, and, and the representative from the company came there. And before he got there, I was just talking. She goes, oh, you know, what are you, what are you measuring deuterium for? And I said, well, we're bringing over, uh, we're getting involved in deuterium depleted water and so on. She goes, what? what? You know, she's like, what, 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 what do you do that for? And, and I told her the story. That, that I kind of related to in, in just a few minutes. She goes, I can't even believe it. You know, I've owned this machine for three years and I never even heard of this. And I'm going, what do you do with it? And she goes, well, I do things like I test like mollusks, mollusks with, for deuterium. But, and, and then I said, that's interesting. You know, where do you do this? She goes, well, one of the places I've been for the last few years is Antarctic. What? Yes. And I mean, she, whatever, they take water samples and they measure what the seaweed deuterium, you know, because deuterium is a really easy indicator for processes, okay? Geologic processes. So she goes, but there's something that's like resonating in my mind because, you know, she said, when you belong to the research groups, there's like, you go to cafeterias and, 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 and mess halls to get your food. And she goes, I re- just remember just collecting things that I never could figure out. And I didn't care either. But there were so many conversations like, hey, Jim, how's your kidney doing? Or how's your this doing? And there were conversations about the improvement in health that she didn't pick up on. As, well, who, you know, who cares? You know. But she said, I wonder if it could have to do with the fact that these people are drinking like straight on 89 ppm water for their whole stay in Antarctica. Wow. So there's another piece of the equation. So wow. if I could ask cool. just one more quick yeah, question. for sure. Tied onto that. Um, are they just melting the ice from Antarctica? Yeah, and, the, and snow, the snow and ice in Antarctic. And I don't know a lot of details. But it is and I'm, all low. And maybe it's just the restriction of going there. But wouldn't it be cheaper to just go and get a big hey, bunch of ice from Antarctica? And, and Do you think if you can swing that deal, I'm in. <laughs> okay? Because I figure one freighter could bring back all we ever need for as long as we're going to live. Mm-hmm. And right. uh, I, I have asked many people, and 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 it's just don't even don't even go there, don't even think about it. Mm. So okay, but it's a it, thank it, you. It is it is the way to do it. Wow, wow. We got to get the flat earthers to all get together and <laughs> break this system down. <laughs> Going to make a deal with NATO and the Warsaw yeah, Pact. Exactly. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. So you asked some pretty pretty cool yeah, questions. Yeah. Thanks, man. Thank you Thank so you. much. Thanks for having me. Yeah, for sure. All right. Who's up next? Want to come up? This is fun. I want to do this more often. This is cool. <laughs> I get to just kick back and you ask the questions for once. Where are you from? Name, et cetera. Uh, name my rank. name is uh, Brad Lido. I run a business out of Jackson, Wyoming called Cooking in the Dark. Um, 
So I my questions are are mostly structured around food. Wait, um, what's what's your business about? Give yourself a plug. Oh yeah, sure. Um, I uh, I do private cooking around the uh, Western Wyoming area. Um, my basic mantra is food should be medicine, and um, I just like the experience of meeting new people, engaging in the experience of uh, breaking bread, sharing a meal, and uh, that meal making you feel wonderful. Awesome. So, cool. Cool. Yeah. So thank you. Um, Robert, my question is uh, mostly about hydrogen and hydrogen uptake. Um, from your experience and your research, are there any things uh, dietary wise, any particular foods that help the human organism with their uptake of hydrogen? And kind of following that question, is there are there any sources of natural hydrogen aside from taking a tablet that, that are a way of administering it into your system without going out and buying a tablet? Or is this something that we should all be, um, we should all be focused in obtaining for ourselves? I like questions that challenge me. So, uh, but the very nature of hydrogen being the smallest molecule in the universe and the fact that you can't even keep it in a glass bottle should should lead you to, to the answer. Of this. Sure. Okay. I mean, it, the, the hydrogen when you consume hydrogen in any form, it is extremely rapidly diffused throughout the body. You know, its diffusion coefficient is just extreme. And what is perhaps more interesting is that even though there are literally well over a thousand studies on the benefits of almost every category of health of uh, hydrogen infused water. The gut, an ideal gut with the proper mi uh, uh, microbiome and microbes in it. And I, I, I should know what they are, but I don't, but I bet it's on Tyler DeBaron's website produces about one liter of hydrogen a day. Wow. Okay. And so some people go, well, geez, if it's producing a liter of hydrogen, what the heck do I have to take 15 cc's of hydrogen for? Well, somehow that hydrogen is accounted for. Okay. That, that somehow it's used in a special way in the body that supplemental hydrogen just goes a different pathway or different pathways. I see. So that's one part of the answer. I mean, hydrogen, you know, there's no blood brain barrier for hydrogen. It's just anywhere and everywhere. Um, let's see. What else did I want to say? Um, inhaled hydrogen, also a powerful pa uh, uh, delivery system for mm -hmm. hydrogen uh, is especially effective in cerebral, you know, where there's some cerebral trauma, you know, stroke or an accident, etc. So this is something that to get your guests should note. And there's now much more popular, we're seeing inhalation hydrogen machines. Okay. They can be very expensive. Yeah. You know, you have to think about the service. They're complicated. Um, and also... The, the researchers note a difference between inhaling hydrogen and its effects versus hydrogen-infused water ingestion. I also was wondering about uh, the growth of food, uh, whether hydrogen-infused water has uh, any effect on the growth of vegetables, the growth of uh, anything that requires water that it, that we use as nutrients in our body through food. Um, has there been research done on that to show how it affects the growth process, how it affects the nutrition of those foods, uh, et cetera? My guess, which I wouldn't say is authoritative, would be minimal or no, because the benefits of hydrogen are almost all defined in its regulation of antioxidants and the hydroxyl radical, et cetera. And I don't see that the plant has so many mechanisms for that during its growth phase that it pretty much accommodates itself. 
Um, and also, uh, you know, there have been, when one has atmospheric hydrogen present, you have, have to be very careful because the right ratio of hydrogen and oxygen can blow this room up before you even realize what's happening. And it is sad. There is information that uh, a couple of Chinese researchers in attempting to make tablets are no longer with us. Wow. Okay. That's why you know, I have one of these uh, vital reaction hydrogen inhalers. And yes. It goes up to 7% hydrogen and they say, and I'm like, well, seven, give me 75% hydrogen. Yeah. They say, you don't want to go over seven because then you create a flammable gas and yes. you have electronics. Because you have or, the right you know. stoichiometric proportions of oxygen and hydrogen. So even the tablet, which looks simple to make, is perhaps the most difficult tablet of any made in the world. Wow. It has to be mixed in, in inert gas, the ingredients. I mean, there's all these little things. You have to have special non-spark mixers. and uh, uh, Okay? This is one difficult product to perfect. And I applaud the guys who came along after me and perfected the manufacturing because that was an area that is not my expertise. And... It was an incredible job. Got it. All right. Well, thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, man. Thanks Take care for the of question. your gut, people. <laughs> <laughs> All right. One more question. Come on up. Hi, my name is Tanya, and I have Ricochet Vintage Wares in Joshua Tree. And Robert, uh, for those people that live to a hundred or more mm -hmm. by eating chocolate, smoking cigarettes, and drinking wine. Are they just the anomalies? There aren't many. And chocolate is probably good. Mm -hmm. And wine is probably okay. <laughs> and the cigarettes, I don't know. I think that's a special kind of genetically, <laughs> a genetically prepared person. I'm not sure that can be good. But um, I would say there is obviously the genetic component to living longer there's the epigenetic component and then there's which is part of the epigenetic what you do to enhance your longevity so those you know it's kind of those three things and um i think if we're talking living really longer lo not like oh you know, like the, i think the oldest woman on, on the planet is is like 118 something like this. It seems to change once in a while, but about 118. And, you know, people who are 118, they're not spry. They're just living. Good point. And that's great. Mm -hmm. But we're talking in the Russian things, these are people who are having babies, okay, in their later years and lived well over 100 just vibrantly. So I think that's going to be one of the most interesting things to watch is this new deuterium depleted, depleted biohack. And, you know, what it's going to be in 50 years, that'll be a fascinating study. Absolutely. Anything else? That was a great question. <laughs> I think that's it. Thanks. Guys. All right, cool. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Well, Robert and and our, our remaining audience, we've got a few diehards here that stuck with us. Man, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for your you're welcome. You know your commitment to science, your commitment to longevity, and uh, and then sharing that information. Also, creating super cool products. You know, I think there there's so much crap out there. I go on the supplement section at Whole Foods, and I'm just like, really. <laughs> Do we really need all this stuff? Even in my own, ca you know, cabinet at home, people. Of course. Thankfully, I'm so grateful. Send me products to try out and things, and I, I think I don't know which one of these things really move the needle. And you really have a knack for zeroing in on a few things that really work. And so, thank you for. Well, you're very welcome. Yeah, thanks for your and commitment. Thank you for having me on your podcast. All right, man. Thank you. Cheers. 